I'm also nervous to bring up this next story. Uh, I don't want to tempt fate, but there hasn't been a big earthquake on the Southern San Andreas Fault for a long time, and we may have found a reason why. NASA made a groundbreaking announcement today, revealing that new data suggests a major seismic event may be imminent on the San Andreas Fault. This discovery is the result of years of intensive study and data gathering utilizing advanced satellite technology and ground sensors. This announcement has enormous implications that could have an impact on millions of residents in California and the surrounding regions. Let's explore the specifics of NASA's investigations, the background and mechanisms of the San Andreas Fault, and the possible repercussions of a significant earthquake along this fault line in today's video. A significant geological structure that runs through California for around 800 miles, one 300 kilometers, the San Andreas Fault forms the tectonic border between the Pacific and North American plates. Because of its tremendous seismic activity and its tendency to create major earthquakes, it is one of the most studied and well-known fault lines in the world. The majority of the plate motion of the San Andreas Fault is horizontal, making it a right lateral strike-slip fault. In relation to the North American plate, this indicates that the Pacific plate is moving northwest. The fault zone is complicated, with several portions that vary in their level of activity and ability to cause earthquakes. Northern segment stretches from Northern California's Mendocino Triple Junction to the San Francisco Bay Area. This section has a substantial seismicity history and is known to produce major earthquakes. It passes through an area that is densely populated, with big cities like San Francisco and San Jose. The devastating 1906 San Francisco earthquake, which was estimated to have had a magnitude of 7.9, left extensive damage and fire damage in its wake. Central segment stretches from the Bay Area in San Francisco to the area of Parkfield, almost midway between San Francisco and Los Angeles. The creeping section, which is a feature of the central segment, is where the fault moves slowly and continuously lowering the likelihood of big eruptions. This segment's consistent seismic behavior has led to a great deal of research. The 1857 Fort Tijon earthquake, which was estimated to have had a magnitude of 7.9, significantly damaged central California. Likewise, the Parkfield earthquakes, known as the earthquake capital of the world, the Parkfield area experiences quite frequent seismic activity. Southern segment stretches from Southern California's Parkfield to the Salton Sea. There hasn't been a big earthquake in the Southern segment for more than 160 years, which raises questions about the likelihood of a big one happening soon. It is an essential region of attention for seismic hazard assessment, since it passes close to important urban centers, including Los Angeles, Riverside, and San Bernardino. The 1857 Fort Tejon earthquake had a major effect on the southern segment in addition to being connected to the central segment. Before European settlers arrived, native populations probably endured numerous earthquakes along the San Andreas Fault. Nevertheless, detailed records only started to be maintained between the 18th and 19th centuries. 1812, Wrightwood Earthquake, December 8, 1812, with a 7.5 magnitude. Wrightwood in particular was impacted by this earthquake in Southern California. At Mission San Juan Capistrano, which led to the collapse of the Great Stone Church, killing 40 people, it caused severe ground shaking and damage to Spanish missions. 1857, Fort Tejon Earthquake. On January 9, 1857, the magnitude was 7.9, rupturing the fault for around 225 miles, 350 kilometers, it was one of the biggest earthquakes in California history. The small but densely populated area suffered relatively few casualties compared to its size, but it changed the terrain and caused significant ground displacement. The 1906 San Francisco earthquake April 18, 1906, had a magnitude of 7.9. Perhaps the most infamous earthquake in California's history, it wrought substantial damage in San Francisco and nearby areas. The earthquake and ensuing fires destroyed nearly 80% of the city, killed an estimated 3,000 people, and left hundreds of thousands homeless. 
This incident emphasized the catastrophic potential of the San Andreas Fault and prompted breakthroughs in seismology and earthquake engineering. The 1957 Daly City Earthquake, March 22, 1957, with a magnitude of 5.7. This earthquake occurred just south of San Francisco, close to Daly City. Even while it wasn't as bad as the 1906 earthquake, it somehow severely destroyed many older structures that weren't made to withstand seismic activity. The 1966 Parkfield Earthquake A magnitude of 6.0 was recorded on June 28, 1966. Parkfield, which is well known for its regular seismic activity, previously had a moderate earthquake that gave scientists investigating the fault valuable data. The Parkfield Earthquake Prediction Experiment was founded in response to this earthquake, with the goal of improving earthquake forecasting methods. The 1989 Loma Prieta Earthquake, October 17, 1989, at 6.9 magnitude. This earthquake, which rocked the San Francisco Bay Area, left the Cypress Street Viaduct and a portion of the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge in ruins. It caused nearly 3,700 injuries, 63 fatalities, and billions of dollars in damages. Because the earthquake happened during the 1989 World Series, it received extensive media coverage. The 2004 Parkfield Earthquake, September 28, 2004, with a 6.0 magnitude. The extensive monitoring and instrumentation in place at Parkfield made this earthquake noteworthy for the scientific community. It did not result in significant damage, but it did yield important information about the behavior of the San Andreas Fault and the processes leading up to earthquakes. Though there haven't been any significant earthquakes since the Loma Prieta catastrophe in 1989, seismic activity on the San Andreas Fault has persisted in recent years. Smaller earthquakes and continuous stress buildup along the fault segments, however, suggest that there is still a high likelihood of major earthquakes in the future. When it comes to monitoring Earth's geological activity with advanced equipment, NASA has been at the forefront. NASA collects information on the motions and buildup of stress on the San Andreas Fault using a combination of ground-based devices and satellite-based remote sensing. So, what are these? Let's find out. Interferometric Synthetic Aperture Radar, INSAR. NASA uses one of its most powerful instruments, Interferometric Synthetic Aperture Radar, INSAR, to track ground displacement along the San Andreas Fault. This method makes use of satellite radar scans to identify minute variations in the Earth's surface over time. In order for INSAR to function, radar signals are sent from satellites to the Earth, and the time it takes for the signals to return is measured. Scientists are able to identify changes in the Earth's surface on a millimeter scale by comparing radar images obtained at different times. Finding locations of stress accumulation along the fault is one application where INSAR is especially helpful. It is capable of identifying ground deformation brought on by volcanic eruptions, tectonic movements, and other geophysical phenomena. When determining the chance of an earthquake, this information is essential. One of the main sources of INSAR data is NASA's Sentinel-1 satellites, which are a component of the European Space Agency's Copernicus program. INSAR capabilities will be further improved by the planned NASA ISRO Synthetic Aperture Radar NISAR, mission, which is a collaboration between NASA and the Indian Space Research Organization ISRO. Global Positioning System GPS, Networks in order to keep an eye on the San Andreas Fault, NASA also uses a vast network of GPS stations. The movements of the Earth's surface are precisely measured by these stations. GPS stations are able to determine precise positions because they are able to continuously receive signals from a constellation of satellites. Through monitoring these locations over time, scientists can identify crustal motions on Earth. The speed and direction of tectonic plate movements are determined using GPS data. It assists scientists in determining areas where tension is accumulating and in understanding how stress is dispersed along the fault. This data is essential for determining the danger of earthquakes. 
The National Science Foundation-funded Plate Boundary Observatory, PBO, is a component of the EarthScope project and consists of multiple GPS stations along the San Andreas Fault. PBO and NASA work together to analyze GPS data for earthquake research. Seismometers. Ground-based devices called seismometers are used to identify and document the vibrations brought on by seismic waves. A network of seismometers along the San Andreas Fault is supported by NASA in order to track seismic activity. Three dimensions of ground motions are measured by seismometers, vertical, north-south, and east-west. The seismometer measures the seismic waves produced by the rupture when an earthquake happens. Earthquakes are located, their magnitudes are calculated, and their sources are studied using data from seismometers. It aids in the understanding of the behavior of the fault and the identification of seismic activity patterns. NASA-supported seismometers are part of two important networks, the Southern California Seismic Network, SCSN, and the Northern California Seismic System, NCSS. Real-time data on seismic activity along the San Andreas Fault is available through these networks. Light Detection and Ranging, LIDAR. High-resolution maps of the Earth's surface are produced using a remote sensing technique called Light Detection and Ranging, or LIDAR, which employs laser pulses. NASA studies the topography of the San Andreas Fault Zone using LIDAR data. LIDAR devices measure the time it takes for laser pulses to return after they are emitted toward the Earth. Detailed three-dimensional maps of the terrain are made using this data. Scientists can quantify surface deformations, locate fault traces, and examine the geomorphology of the fault with the use of LIDAR data. It is especially helpful in identifying minute details that can point to tectonic activity. High-resolution topographic data has been gathered by surveying the San Andreas Fault using NASA's Airborne Topographic Mapper, ATM, and other LIDAR-equipped aircraft. Ground-based radar interferometry, high-resolution measurements of ground deformation over smaller areas are provided by ground-based radar interferometry, which is a complementary technique to satellite-based INSAR. Ground-based radar interferometry works similarly to INSAR in that it measures the signals returned by the radar after they are sent to the ground. Tripods or other structures are usually used to mount ground-based systems. Using this method, Particular locations along the San Andreas Fault, such as places of known deformation or vital infrastructure, are monitored. It offers precise readings that may be used to identify early indications of fault movement. Targeted places are equipped with ground-based radar devices, such as those created by NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, to continuously monitor the fault. Advanced computer models and algorithms are used to integrate and analyze the data gathered from these many monitoring systems. By using an integrated approach, scientists are able to recognize trends, evaluate dangers, and create early warning systems. The most recent NASA release is predicated on a thorough examination of the information gathered from these powerful monitoring methods. The results indicate that stress accumulation has significantly increased along several sections of the San Andreas Fault, especially in the southern section close to Los Angeles. The probability of a significant seismic event along the San Andreas Fault is elevated, as indicated by several important indicators. The southern length of the fault exhibits high stress accumulation, as indicated by data obtained from GPS and INSAR networks. It is possible that the fault is locked and holding on to elastic strain energy that could be released in a future earthquake because there hasn't been a significant earthquake in more than 160 years. Ground deformation patterns seen in INSAR data are compatible with the accumulation of tectonic stress. These patterns show that, especially in the vicinity of large cities like Los Angeles, the fault is locked in some locations while suffering aseismic creep in others. Microseismic activity is increasing along the fault, according to seismometer data. Although there is no immediate danger from these minor earthquakes, they could be a sign of shifting stress levels and the possibility of a bigger seismic catastrophe. Likewise, along the fault, 
LiDAR studies have revealed minor topographic changes as well as new surface faulting. These characteristics help improve simulations of how the fault might behave in the future by supplying proof of previous seismic activity. So, what actually happens? When San Andreas releases the big one, and could the catastrophe depicted in the film San Andreas possibly occur? A 9.0 magnitude earthquake is caused by the San Andreas Fault in the movie. Andreas Fault are a crucial reminder of the importance of staying informed and prepared for potential seismic activity. If you found this video insightful, make sure to give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends and family to help spread awareness. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and ring the bell icon so you never miss an update from our channel. We bring you the latest news and insights on science, technology, and more. Let's stay informed and prepared together. Thanks again for tuning in, and see you in the next video.